بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We begin the name of Allah. All praise and glory be to Allah. And may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. We ask Allah عز وجل to make us of those allegiant to his path and consistent on his path. And may we be reunited around him on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. We welcome everyone back to our studies and discussions on Surah Al-Kahf. This will be our uh, final segment for a while on uh, chapter 2 of Surah Al-Kahf. And we chose to uh, summarize Surah Al-Kahf as being a chapter of the Quran that is comprised of four stories. And this second chapter is the second story, the story of the, uh, the owner of the two gardens. And we said that this is a true story, it is not made up, but at the same time it is symbolic in that it symbolizes, it represents a sample of so many patterns in human history, people that are deluded by their worldly possessions from Allah Azza wa Jal, the provider, and from paradise, the true gardens, uh, that are not temporary, that are, will never disappoint. And last week we discussed much of the commentary between the second story and then the third story and there's a lot in fact tonight we will discuss some more of the commentary the remaining commentary after the second story of the two gardens and even before we get into it i, I think it is worth appreciating because many times people wonder like why does the quran tell stories the way it does like Stories that are repeated, for example. The stories of Surah Al-Kahf aren't really repeated anywhere else in the Quran. But why does this, you know, why are certain stories or certain themes repeated in the Quran? It is worth stopping at because ordinarily a person wouldn't really, you know, repeat the same story over and over and over again. But of course, the, the Quran does so with such variation, right? Uh, that the, the rhetorical brilliance, the, the language the appeal, the beauty remains unblemished. It's not harmed because of the variation with which it tells the stories and with how it spaces it out. And, but repetition is important. Just because we're not used to it doesn't mean it's ideal that we don't repeat. Human beings not repeating stories too much, yeah, because human beings get redundant if they repeat the same story over and over and over again. But the way the Quran tells the story each time and the location the Quran situates each story gives it profound benefit. And uh, even on one last point on repetition, why does the Quran repeat stories? It is like when parents have to tell their children a thousand times, clean your room, <laughs> right? We all have a little child inside of us and all of our rooms are messy. The room up here and the room in here is messy, right? And so we need constant reinforcement through repetition of these stories so that they, uh, they settle and they, they're able to finally make the journey into our souls, into our personalities, into our behavior. And there are many other wisdoms for the Quranic stories being repeated, but we will stop there, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And we can revisit that concept at a later time. Another atypical way, though, the Quran tells stories, aside from repetition, is that it chops up stories. Right? Like why doesn't it just say the story, the whole story, in one place in the Qur'an from beginning to end? It segments stories. Why is that? The scholar said for the same reason, that you don't get too, too absorbed into the narration of the story, the, the story line, that you become a passive listener or a passive reader. Right? It pulls you into a story and pulls you right back out. You know many a times when people are reading books, novels, or movies, they forget themselves in the storyline. Right? Like something could be making them feel a certain way and they don't even stop to inspect, why do I feel this way? I shouldn't feel this way, right? Because they're just so absorbed in the story. You know, like the famous like, love stories, apparently not just in Bollywood. Uh, may Allah guide us all, right? Just father says no, they run away, and then, you know, they're off somewhere, and then they're finally alone. It's all romanticized, right? Then the dad comes and starts knocking on the door, and... And then you're watching and you're like, <gasps> you know, as if it's a horrible thing. Now, this is a good thing that he caught this guy who, <laughs> who took his daughter, right? This is a good thing, not a bad thing. 
but you just identify with the main character as presented by the story. Then he finally breaks the door in and the guy like jumps out the window in the nick of time. Hopefully there's a fire escape or hope, hopefully not. I don't know. <laughs> right? And then you go, oh, Alhamdulillah. It's like, Alhamdulillah. Like if that was your daughter, it wouldn't have been Alhamdulillah. It would have been a completely different reaction. That is the danger of getting too absorbed in the story. Right? لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتٌ لِلسَّائِلِينَ Allah said in the story of Yusuf, for example, and his brothers are signs for those that are asking, those that are trying to be inquisitive. What should I be learning from this? And so the, the reason why stories are segmented is to help you snap out of it, be an active participant and ask yourself, what is here for me? How do I cross over these lessons into my life? Right? لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ there is in their stories a lesson for people that are of intelligence. So intelligent people, they take ibra. The word ibra, by the way, comes from the word ubur. Ubur means to cross over a bridge. So those people that have intelligence, they use the stories of the Quran to cross them over into their life. That's the idea. The lesson is crossed over. And so the way the Quran tells stories is for that reason. If you don't look at the Quranic stories this way, you're going to struggle to understand why we had a story of a tale of two gardens that was summarized briefly, right, in two sessions. And then the commentary on these stories is happening for another two, three sessions. Well, that's the whole idea. The Quran is not a storybook. The Quran is actually more preaching than it is stories, right? Storytelling. The story is just like a placeholder, a simple scene, and then what do we have to learn from it? So tonight is the second half of what we have to learn from the stories of Surah Al-Kahf, in particular the second story. So we stopped here at the 53rd verse in Surah Al-Kahf. When Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about those who find their book in front of them and they're blown away, they're shocked by how much detail is in that book, the scroll of deeds on the Day of Judgment, right? Uh, and they don't just see the book. The last verse we stopped at, I believe, وَرَأَى الْمُجْرِمُونَ النَّارِ And they see, then they see the fire. They're, they make eye contact, if you will, with the fire itself. The criminals see the fire. فَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ مُوَاقِعُوهَا And so they realize that they are bound to fall into it. وَلَمْ يَجِدُوا عَنْهَا مَصْرِفَا And they will find no way to escape it. So a, a person will see the fire. People will see the fire. You know, not just will a person see the fire, may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us and you safety, the fire will see you. You know, in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِذَا رَأَتْهُمْ مِن مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ سَمِعُوا لَهَا تَغَيُّضًا وَزَفِيرًا When it sees them from a distant place. So it is said that the fire perhaps has a very long neck, it's very tall. And it sees them like, where are those who committed crimes against my Lord, right? When it sees them from a distant place, it will see you, it's coming looking. And it will see you before you see it. When it sees them from a distant place, they will hear coming from it, uh, a rage, a boiling rage and an exhale. They will hear it breathing. And will hear its anger. Uh, and then the other ayah says what? And then we will, the day we will say to the hellfire, are you full yet? From all we've placed inside you, are you full yet? And it will say, is there more? So the hellfire will see, the hellfire will speak, the hellfire will exhale, will breathe, right? And so the, the believers will see and experience all of this. Forgive me, the criminals will see and experience all of this. فَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ مُوَاقِعُوهَا And so they will realize. ظن here means they, they will become certain. They will become sure. Because the word ظن in the Arabic language isn't always assume, isn't always assumption. It is also certainty. Like the ayah, الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ Those who are certain they will meet their Lord. Right? So at that moment they will be certain that they will fall into it. وَلَمْ يَجِدُوا عَنْهَا مَصْرِفَةً and they will not find any way to escape it. Masrif is like another option. There will be nowhere to go. Like sarf, sarf even in currency, they like masraf for money, is when you, you give them one currency and they give you 
Another option, an option you can use in that country, right? That's called a masrif. Because even sarf in, in Arabic grammar is, is morphology, right? How you switch up the word to fit it into a different sentence, right? Masrif. So they will not find any masrif, meaning they will not find any uh, other place to be sent. They will wish they could be sent anywhere else, but they will not find anywhere else to be sent. And we explained the hadith last week of those who will come to the brink of the fire thinking their idols will help them, thinking their leaders will help them, thinking those that they accepted in place of Allah Azza wa Jal will help them. I told you this could be idols like statues. It could also be human beings. Because if you accept someone to set up laws like Allah Azza wa Jal sets up laws, then you've accepted them as a Lord, right? You've worshipped them alongside Allah Azza wa Jal. That's one of the several forms of shirk, of equating others with Allah. And so when they get there to the edge of the cliff, they'll realize that they will fall in and there will be no masrif, no other place to be sent off to. Next ayah, 54. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا And we've certainly sent forth in this Qur'an every kind of lesson for people. But humankind is the most argumentative of all beings. So, first of all, contrast or connect. I always tell you, connect. Why is this verse here? I've been doing that with you all, all series, right? Allah Azza wa Jal is saying this will be their state in the fire. And now, here's the Quran. If anyone wants to save themselves, here's the Quran. There's actually a, a beautiful linguistic uh, subtlety here that the scholars point out that exists all over the Quran. It's called Tajanus. Tajanus, I don't know how they translate Tajanus. Uh, like Al Jins Al Wahid are things that are identical or similar, homogenous. Tajanus, right? And so there is Allah Azza wa Jal when He speaks from the eloquence of the Quran is that He uses words close together that sound alike for different reasons for you to look for the connections for you to notice the connections also perhaps for you to help to help you memorize the quran as well and so where's the tajanus here in the verse before it can you go back to 53 for a second the last word is masrifa sarafa masrif remember i spent some time saying to, to, you will not be sent anywhere else the next verse, go back to 54, it says, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا You caught it? Masrifan is the last word of the previous verse. Then this verse says, we have sarrafna. We have sent your way. On the day of judgment, you're not going to be sent away from the fire if you come to it. Right? But here in this world, you want to escape the fire? I have sent your way an escape mechanism. I've sent your way a salvation, a rope. I've extended it to you. And so that, that is the subtlety, here is your exit, last stop, anyone else willing to get off the crash course, this Qur'an is your last stop, your last opportunity. That is the benefit of using words that have similar sounds, similar, you know, phonetic weight uh, or structure. وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ So we have sent your way in this Qur'an لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلِ A parable or an example or every example for humanity. In other words, we've given you so many examples to help you understand so that there will be no excuse left for you or for someone that cannot understand. Like, why can't you understand? Uh, if you're mentally impaired, this is not addressing you, right? But if you're someone that Allah has given a proper mind, some sensibility, he has diversified for you. He's given you facts, and he's given you stories, and he's given you amthal, parables, examples. What we give you every example. Uh, but you know, human beings have this amazing talent of dismissing every argument, right? Dismissing any, every proof that doesn't suit what they want, their wants, their desires. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا And the human being is more than anything else argumentative. Or more than any other creature. Another meaning here, argumentative. I told you once the Prophet ﷺ recited that phrase to who? Who remembers? 
Ali radiallahu anhu, when he entered upon his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha and her husband, his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, he expected to see them praying the night prayers and they were not praying the night prayers. So he said, why don't you rise and pray your Qiyamul Layl, your night prayers? Parenting never stops, huh? It should change though. You should not speak to a 25-year-old married person like you speak to a two-and-a-half-year-old <laughs> toddler creature, right? <laughs> But he's still checking up on his children, right? So he says, you're not praying Qiyamul Layl. And so Ali radiallahu an, of course, not uh, in a way that would be disrespectful or inappropriate or even stubborn. He said, Ya Rasulullah, our souls are in the hands of Allah. If he wishes to wake us up, he wake us up. If he doesn't wish to wake us up, he doesn't wish to wake us up. And so the Prophet والسلام, laughed or smiled and said, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا Human beings argue more than any other creature. Of course, this is like a safe, light-hearted, you know, response. But human beings do this on a very dangerous level. They justify every falsehood, right? With argumentation, with supposed logic, you know, with presenting the positive side of it, even if it could be 99% negative. You know, I, I hate to cite myself, but today's khutbah. Like the packaging, it, who's against diversity, right? Who's against love? <laughs> who's against the minority groups? Who, the, 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 the packaging of the message are positive notions that we should be supporting as Muslims. But when you get to the details, <laughs> there's something that becomes extremely problematic. Even liberalism in general, which is like the mother from which all of these things come out, right? The, just the, the liberal worldview, it needs bounds. Who, who's ever against freedom? We're pro-freedom, right? Like how many, how many instances and circumstances are there in Islam where a person is given a preference? The halal is more than the haram, right? How much encouragement is there in Islam to free slaves, for example, right? Freedom is a huge concept in our deen. But freedom to, to self-destruct is, is not what we're talking about here. So every concept can be argued to be positive. Like something that is pure evil from every angle is very hard to identify really. Right? No sensible person would ever sign up to that. But they are either deceived or trying to deceive others by pointing out, using faulty log logic, faulty argumentation, the little positive in it at the expense of or for the sake of hiding all of its negative. And st so stay away from engaging in argumentation and be careful of just responding for the sake of responding. Uh, By the way, you know, this ayah, some people that are critics of the Quran or those who try to nitpick at the Quran, they say they can hold on to these general terms like the word kul. We sent you away from this Quran. Min kulli mathal. Every example. Every example of what? Every parenting scenario example? Every agricultural, an example for every agricultural method? No, it's obviously what's not meant, what, that's obviously not what's meant. And no one, you know, with, with a, <laughs> a whiff of intelligence, because people will try to tell you the Quran is like hyperbolic and absolute and exaggerates and... But these are general terms with intended meanings, right? There's no trip up here. There's no, this would be a, a very shallow mistake for an intelligent human being to make, right? But if you just try to understand people even, they don't mean that when they generalize, right? They mean by and large. They may use a general term, but they mean something specific. You know, I'll give you a, an easy example in the Quran that we use in Usul al-Fiqh. Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, Uh, the people of Ad, we sent upon them this vicious wind uh, containing a painful torment to demiru kulla shayin, right? That destroys everything by permission from its Lord. Does that mean the planet Earth was destroyed? And the sun, because the sun is part of everything, the sun is a thing, right? No one understands this, no one should understand this. Right? Everything is a general term and it means every person that was there, nothing remains but their houses, as the other ayat mentioned. 
And so I, I just uh, I like to point that out because some those who are either inheriting Orientalist criticisms or read for Orientalists, I don't know who still does, they find this these lousy, lazy criticisms against the Quran recycled. You know, uh, they say the Quran says it has de detailed out for you everything. Everything you need to know is in the Quran. Well, uh, did it detail out for us, as one scholar was told or challenged, did it detail out for us how to make bread? Or, or how many loaves of bread can be made through a, with a bag of flour? He said, yes, it did tell us that. <laughs> and so he said, what do you mean? Uh, he said, he told uh, one of his students, go, go get the baker from the bakery, bring him to me. So he brought the baker and, and he asked the baker how many loaves of bread come out of a bag of flour. He said the small bag makes this amount of loaves and the big bag, the five pound or the five kilo, makes this amount of loaves. And he said, see? He said, where is that in the Quran? He said, well, the Quran told us, you know, Ask the people who know when you don't know, right? And so even when the Quran says it told you everything, meaning it gave you a lead, right? It gave you the principles by which you will learn and you will know and you will understand all that you need to. Part of what it taught us is the importance to learn, right? And to respect expertise and otherwise. In any case, if that was of interest to you, Alhamdulillah, if it wasn't, I'm sorry. Next ayah, 55. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا مَنَعَ النَّاسَ أَن يُؤْمِنُوا إِذْ جَاءَهُمُ الْهُدَى وَيَسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّهُمْ إِلَّا أَن تَأْتِيَهُمْ سُنَّةُ الْأَوَّلِينَ أَوْ يَأْتِيَهُمُ الْعَذَابُ قُبُلًا And nothing prevented people, meaning in the past, from believing when guidance came to them and prevented them from seeking their Lord's forgiveness except their demand to meet the same faith of the earlier deniers. Or that the torment would confront them face to face. So in other words, people before you, and here you are again, stubborn defiance, the pattern, you know, again, instead of simply saying, Oh Allah, forgive me, if you're there, right? <laughs> instead of saying, you know, Oh Allah, I believe, just in case, or instead of actually considering what the Prophet came, they say, Oh Allah, send the punishment upon us. They challenged God. This is the intended meaning of the verse here. You know, like Surah Al-Anfal, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal says regarding the people right before the Battle of Badr, and the disbelievers said, Allahumma in kana hadha huwa al-haqq min indika fa'amtir alayna hijaratan min as sama O oh Allah, if this is the truth from you, then send raining down upon us stones from the sky. Of course, that didn't happen. Allah Azza wa Jal, by and large, since the time of Musa alayhi salam onward, punished the defiant people at the hands of righteous believers. That's what happened, right? And the Battle of Badr took place, where they least expected it, outnumbered and out artilleried the believers, and they still lost. That's really what happened. But in any case, uh, the worst of the worst people, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, they underestimate and they ignore the invitation to believe and they don't consider any of the proofs and they don't seek forgiveness from their Lord and instead they just make fun and demand that the punishment come. By the way, this, this ayah proves that even if you were the worst of the worst of the creation, and you sought forgiveness from Allah, Allah would forgive you. Right? Saying, these people who defied the prophets, these stubborn folks, and here you are repeating you know, their crime, had they just sought forgiveness instead of doing what they did. Meaning he would have forgiven them. This is like the ayah in Surah uh, Al-Buruj. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمِ those who burned alive, persecuted for their faith, and burned alive, the believing men and believing women, and did not repent, they will go to the fire. For them is the torment of the fire. Al-Hasan al-Basri, when he read that ayah, he said, look how generous Allah is. He qualified it with, if they don't repent. Meaning, had they repented, these people who were so cold-hearted that they dug out trenches and watched the believers, men, women, and children, get burned alive in front of them, had they made tawbah, Allah would have accepted their tawbah. 
he would have forgiven them and loved them all over again. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, and what is the end of the ISA? That they demanded, illa anta, they were stubborn until ta'tiyahum sunnatul awaleen, until the demise of the previous nations happened to them, right? Destruction. Or that the punishment come to them face to face. What does that mean? What do you think it means? Huh? One of the two interpretations is the day of judgment. Like death, the angel of death comes to you, see him coming to you. That's why I said, because the narrations mention you see the, the, the angel of death. In other words, either one, a punishment comes down from above, unexpected demise, catches you off guard, while you're sleeping perhaps, or while you're heedless, as Surah Al-A'raf says, while asleep or while unaware, right? So that's the first one, Sunnatul Awaleen. The other one is, يَأْتِيَكُمْ الْعَذَابُ قُبُلَ Or comes to you straight in front of you, that means the angel of death, day of judgment, or it means what? The other interpretation was? He saw the angels, yeah. But what's the other meaning of, of see the punishment come face to face? I already hinted at it. The believers on the battlefield. They said that this perhaps is hinting at Allah soon permitting jihad because he did not permit for the first years for the Prophet ﷺ to even defend himself. So they said, uh, destruction at the hands of the believers at Bedr and or onwards, right? Next ayah. وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ وَيُجَادِلُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِالْبَاطِلِ لِيُدْحِضُوا بِهِ الْحَقَّ وَاتَّخَذُوا آيَاتِ وَمَا أُنْذِرُوا هُزُوَا Allah Azza wa Jal is then saying, and we did not send the messengers except as deliverers of good news and as warners. Well, what is, the, what is the other option? What else could they be sent as? Tie it with the ayat before it. Tie it with the previous discussion. The purpose of the prophets is to bring you hope and bring you fear. Bring you good news, reminders of the reward and the punishment. Right? That's the purpose of the prophets. In other words, what? The prophets are not here to do what? They're not here to strong arm you. They're not here to win an argument. They're not here to debate with you. Their proofs speak for themselves. They are clear enough. I'm letting you know. This is a declaration. Just like I'm sending this Quran for your exit. It's your job whether you want to be argumentative or not. They're not here to argue with you. The, and this is all throughout. The prophets are sent as bearers of glad tidings and warners. Huh? Yeah, the rahma is mercy, right? The rahma is mercy. I'm sorry, the, the bushra is rahma. <laughs> the bushra is mercy. The glad tidings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, Allah azza wa jal's reward, right? They're, they're not here to do beyond what they do. They teach you, they encourage you, they frighten you, and you got to do something. Like you bring the horse to water, that's it. The horse has to drink now. Because there is no reason or logic that can be accepted even if you state it. Yani, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرَةُ وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرَةُ Allah says the human being knows that he's doing the wrong thing even if he expresses excuses, even if he puts forth justifications for his, for his deviance, for his or her misguidance. But in reality though, I mean, you look at the Prophet ﷺ, do you have any logical reason to reject him? Absolutely not. Right? You look at his character ﷺ. How could he be a false prophet? You know, the honest and trustworthy. Everyone testified to this. You look at the miracles he performed, you saw them firsthand, right? And on top of them all the Quran, which every generation sees. Then you look at the balance and the beauty of his message. <laughs> like when someone, uh, you know, uh, wants to say that 
Satan was whispering to the Prophet Muhammad well, sure, anybody can, can suggest anything, but the Quran tells you, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Right? One genius said, but that could be reverse psychology. He's telling you seek refuge from shaitan so that you don't realize it's actually shaitan who's like, you know, bringing this Quran. Well, okay, but the Quran also teaches us all of these good things. Go to all the devil worshippers of the world. Ask them what they're teaching their, their congregants, right? Are they teaching them to be good to their family and not to be vengeful and to keep ties of, of kinship and be charitable with others? Is that what shayateen do? Not what shayateen do. So you look at the, the message itself. How profound, how pure. People recognize this within themselves. And then look at the knowledge that he brought والسلام, of the lost past that he couldn't have known. And then the knowledge of the future. The dozens and dozens of times he accurately and specifically speaks about the future والسلام, and the past. All of this, can there really be a logical you know, ground for arguing here? There isn't. <sighs> And so the, <clears throat> the disbelievers argue falsely. They know it is false when they are arguing. And they just take my signs and my revelations as a mockery, as a laughing, uh, a cause for laughter and taunting. Next ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ ذُكِّرَ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِ فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهَا And who does more wrong than those who when reminded of their Lord's revelations, they turn away from them. وَنَسِيَ مَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَاهِ And he forgets what his own, his own hands have done. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةً أَنْ يَفْقَهُوهُ وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقُرًا We've certainly casted covers or veils over their hearts. <clears throat> and we have, uh, so that they cannot understand it, this Quran. And we've placed blockades, blockages in their ears, deafness in their ears. And if you were to continue to invite them to the guidance, they will never be rightly guided anymore. So a few quick stops at this ayah because it has been 40 minutes already or a little less than that. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ This is recurrent in the Quran. Who does more wrong? What does this mean? Is this a question? Like an actual question that is seeking an answer? What is this called? This is called a rhetorical question, right? This is istifham bima'na nafi When you ask a question to make a point, like no one asks a question of their opponent, if they're your opponent, this is just like in mantiq, right? Just like uh, how do you have a logical discourse and you know, effective debating. Uh, you don't ask your opponent a question unless you're sure of the answer, right? And so a rhetorical question is when instead of you saying it, there's nobody worse than those who turn away from God's signs after they come to them. It's you put, putting it on them for them to, to confess it instead of you declaring it. Who is worse? Meaning, there is nobody worse. That is the intent of a rhetorical question or the mechanics uh, of the rhetorical question. Who is worse? Meaning, nobody is worse than the one who when reminded of the verses of his Lord. You know, this is proof of what? That you are only liable to believe after the verses of your Lord reach you. After Islam clearly reaches you. Right? Because the problem is when the verses come to you and you still reject them. This is when a person becomes liable for their kufr. Liable for their shirk. Yes, in this world we have no choice. We don't know what's in people's hearts. We don't know what they're convinced of and whether the proof was clear to them. They recognized it as from God or not. We don't know. And so we have no choice but to judge based on what's apparent. This is a Muslim, this is not a Muslim. Like you ask him, you'd believe, he says no. So you can't come and say maybe he believes. He just said he doesn't. All right? That would just leave us in disarray. And so this person is a Muslim. I don't know what's in his heart. Right? I can't say for sure he's going to paradise. 
because I don't know what's in his heart. I don't know in what condition he's going to die. Likewise, this person says he's a disbeliever, a non-believer. So, I understand him as such. I also don't know what's in his heart. I can't say for sure he's going to the fire. I don't know. But in the sight of Allah, this discussion is speaking about in the sight of Allah. Whoever Allah knows that his signs reached, that person becomes liable. As the other ayah says, uh, say to them, this Quran has been revealed to me, to warn you with it and whoever it reaches. So whoever it reaches is being warned. The warning applies to them. And so even though, this is very important to understand, many people always wonder like what happens to my friends, my colleagues, nice people, like why would they you know, be doomed? No, no, no. Even though believing in Allah is perfectly logical and naturally inborn, okay? Allah Azza wa Jal will not hold you to account for your fitrah. The fact that He placed in you a certainty about Him, that there is a higher power, right? And even a longing to connect with Him. That's all part of your fitrah. You don't just know that there's a God. You may not know His name, but you know there's a God, right? A supreme being. And, and you even want to have a relationship with Him. It's all already there. That is why when the messengers come, it strikes such a deep chord with people. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I've always believed, right? And so the fitrah alone will not make you liable. And logic will also bring you there. Like logically speaking, gratitude, you're supposed to be grateful and God gave me more than everyone, so I'm supposed to be grateful to God more than anyone. And still no. Whoever has their fitrah and is sane is only liable when the third component comes, which is the message reaching them. Once the third message, once the message reaches them, all three boxes are checked, then their liability is activated in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. Is this clear to everyone? Very important, very common question. The youth ask it all the time. You have to be able to articulate it. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, when Allah Azza wa said He took the children of Adam out of the loins of Adam alayhi salam and He made them all testify uh, against themselves and about themselves. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Qalu bala shahidina. They said, yes, we do testify. Qala anta qulu yawm al-qiyamati inna kunna an hadha ghafileen. So you don't come on the day of judgment saying, I was unaware of this. This testimony happened fi alam al-dhar or alam al-arwah. You know, because the souls were created before the bodies. Allah took all of our souls out and He had us testify that He is our Lord. But a Muslim is not someone who believes Allah is his Lord. Because shaitan believes Allah is his Lord, right? A Muslim is someone who accepts Allah as his God also. Not just the Rabb, Rabb but also the Ilah. Because if you truly stay committed to Allah being my Rabb, that would necessitate accepting Him as your Ilah as the object of your worship, the object of your devotion, the source of your morality, the source of your guidance, and so on and so forth, right? We don't say la rabba siwah in our shahada. We say la ilaha illallah, la ma'buda illallah, right? He's the one we worship, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that places inside you the fitrah. You don't remember the incident, but the effects of the incident are why all people deep down inside have this recognition and this driving force towards Allah and His oneness. That's the idea. And Allah knows best. <clears throat> because you know the scholars all like, they all agree you're not born Muslim. Oh boy. This is another can of worms. Nobody's born Muslim. Okay? Because you have to be like, Islam is, is, is an action. It's a, it's a, you have to in, intend it. And you have to know it to intend it. And Allah pulled you out of he pulled you out of your mother's wombs not knowing anything, right? So you're not Muslim or non-Muslim. You're neither. You're just on the fitrah. As you start developing your faculties of hearing and sight and reason and otherwise, that's when things start happening. Is that clear? If Allah blessed you to be among Muslim, uh, a Muslim family, that may facilitate your path. Right? If Allah bless you with humility in your heart and you'll, you'll believe in the message right away that He has facilitated your path. He doesn't do injustice to anyone. Right? This is just a part of that wider discussion. Yes, sir.
Testifying to Allah what? Yes, in, in a very general sense. Like there is a God, there is a creator, right? He's all powerful. This is something you, you can even test, right? Have a baby and put it on an island. Not you. <laughs> Some anthropologist <laughs> who needs their license revoked. But that's what they say. Without any influence, people will recognize God. They, they may even recognize that he's above them. Like they may, when they're stuck, they may look up, right? They don't know his name. They don't know how to connect with him, what prayer looks like. They, don't, they need revelation to reveal these things to them, right? But deep down inside it is there that there is a God, there is a supreme being. This is like wired into our, some say DNA, but our spiritual DNA basically, right? Our metaphysical DNA. Not born Muslim. They're born ready for Islam. Is that good? The fitrah is readiness for Islam. It's like a, like a socket. Only Islam is going to fit. That is why when, when, when you take someone and you tell them God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, it gives them anxiety. It's like, no, no, wait, but God's supposed to not rest. It just doesn't sit right. That's why they come to you and they say it just doesn't add up. I've never actually believed that stuff. As one, one brother said to me, or said in my presence once, I was always haunted by this idea because what do you mean God rests on the seventh day? What do you mean God has a day off? What if I need God on his day off? I always felt insecure because of this notion. This is not the God that I, <laughs> I believe in. Right? Until he finally came across Islam and said, that one. Yes. What the Quran? Yes, that's God. is a baby we consider him no we consider him in in terms of this dunya a muslim right in the general sense but i'm talking now islam in terms of did they intend to be muslim and are rewardable for their islam and no there's no intention to begin with right they don't they intend anything and, and allah Azza wa knows but you know why also babies can't be born muslim because if babies were born muslim that means every non-muslim is actually an apostate because they left Islam. But there's actually two separate categories. There's non-Muslims, <laughs> kuffar asliyin, and there's murtaddin, there's apostates. Two completely sets up, like two different categories in Islamic law, in the Quran and in the Sunnah. If everyone is born Muslim, that means there's no such thing as a kafir. It would only be like Muslim and murtad. That's it. That's not true. Anyway, long discussion. Let's finish this ayat. <sighs> And who does more wrongdoing than the one who is <coughs> reminded of the ayat, the signs of his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَأَعْرَضَ anha, And he ignores it, he comes face to face with it, right? It reaches him, and then he chooses to ignore it, neglects it, turns away from it, and forgets what their hands have done. Meaning, instead of declaring its truth and admitting it and seeking forgiveness for their past crimes, they forget their past crimes. They say, you know, no big deal. I'll figure it out later. After they've seen it. You know, I know one brother. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And this is of, of the signs of Allah's fadl. Uh, he's involved in the da'wah now. He moved down to Maryland from North Jersey. Uh, he says, I read the Quran and I realized for sure the Quran was from Allah Azza wa I was in high school. But in high school, I wanted to party and stuff. and just, So I just threw the Quran aside. I so, said, you know, I'll figure it out later. I just want to have fun. I want to live life. He said, then I went to college. He was in Union City. I went to college <laughs> and 9-11 uh, happened. I'm not sure if I ever shared this story before. 9-11 happened. So everyone leaves class and we come out to the shore. You know, Union City is right there across from Manhattan. Uh, and we see the buildings falling in front of us. And it was petrifying. You know, the terror in our hearts was indescribable. Death never felt so close. You know, so he's in his party life, and then this incident happens. And then he says to me, my, uh, my Indian roommate is standing next to me. They dorm together. He said to me, oh man, I'm going to go pray. So he says to him, pray? What are you? He said, I'm Muslim. He goes, really? <laughs> he never knew. Allah guide us all. But he's like, okay, I'm coming with you. 
and he goes with him, takes his shahada, begins to pray, and mashallah, tabarakallah, he's a, he's a very committed Muslim now, and, and a leader actually in the Muslim community in, in College Park, Maryland. So, uh, but this is not guaranteed. You're not guaranteed unlimited choices. And this is why the ayah, that's exactly what the ayah is saying. That those, instead of seeking forgiveness for their sins and, you know, chasing after the opportunity to, you know, clean up their past, they turn away. And so, inna ja'alna ala qulubihim akinna. We have placed on their heart seals. You see, because God's God. It's very important to establish. God is God. God doesn't owe anyone anything, right? And so, if you turn away, who said you're entitled to unlimited chances? He may give you a second chance, may give you a third chance, may give you a, a 15th chance, but there will come a time where the same way death will end your life and your chances are up, the death of your heart could happen before the death of your body. So he was fair to you by giving you a chance. So if after a few dozen chances out of his generosity, two plus chances is generosity. One chance is fairness, right? After that, he sees, oh, you don't want? I'll give you what you want. You want misguidance? I'll give you misguidance and I'll make you sure that it's guidance. May Allah protect us, right? You know, Mujahid ibn Jabr, the great student of Ibn Abbas, when he was uh, interpreting the ayah, their hearts were diseased and so Allah increased them in disease. He said the truth came to them, or the light came to them, he said, and they kept blocking every path to it. And he went like this. <laughs> closed his five fingers. So Allah sealed their hand shut. That's it. You closed your hand. Over and over and over and over and over again. And so Allah kept your hand closed. You did it to yourself. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةً أَنْ يَفْقَهُوا So they're no longer able to understand the message. وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرَىٰ And their, their ears are blocked. Blocked from listening in a beneficial way. Like it's not passing through here, let alone getting there. And even if it were get, to get there, it would find the heart blockaded. In other words, the pathways, the inlets to guidance and certainty are gone. And that is why the ayah ends with saying, And if you guide such, if you invite such people, they will never become guided, no matter how hard you try. That's why we were sent, we sent you as a bearer of glad tidings and a, a warner. Next slide, inshallah. I have two slides left before we reach uh, the end of the discussion and begin with the story of Musa alayhi salam when we resume our classes. 58, And this is, this is the, the pattern of the Qur'an. J just as the Prophet sent glad tidings and warnings, Allah Azza wa speaks about this scary scene of our heart being sealed, and then He says, And your Lord is the most forgiving, full possessor of mercy. لَوْ يُؤَاخِذُهُمْ بِمَا كَسَبُوا If he were to immediately snatch them due to their earnings, their evil earnings that they committed, لَعَجَّلَ لَهُمُ الْعَذَابِ He would have certainly hastened their punishment, meaning he would have punished them here in this world. بَلْ لَهُمْ مَوْعِدٌ لَنْ يَجِدُوا مِنْ دُونِهِ مَوْئِلَ But instead, they have an appointed time. They have a time. Allah knows their, their limit. Just leave that to Allah. They have an appointed time for which they will find no mau'il, no refuge. So I, I want to say just three things quickly about this ayah. The first of them is that whenever you're coming across the names of Allah in the Qur'an, pay attention. You will find that the dominant feeling you're supposed to have about Allah is love. And here's just an example of that. رَبُّكَ الْغَفُورُ ذُو الرَّحْمَةِ your Lord is the most forgiving, full of mercy. And He is the severe punisher? No. He said, and if He were to punish. You notice that? They're not the same thing. It's not a 50-50 split between mercy and punishment. Your Lord, this is who He is. And if He happens to punish, it's bad. If He happens to punish, it's bad. That pattern is all throughout the Quran. I'll give you a few. One of, another one, Allah Azza wa Jal says, 
وإذ تأذن ربكم لإن شكرتم لأزيدنكم And your Lord has declared that if you are grateful, I will increase you. وَلَئِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ And if you deny, I will decrease you? No. He says, إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ My punishment is severe. That's all he said. It's not the same thing, if you notice. The other one, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala says, نَبِّئْ عِبَادِي أَنِّي أَنَا الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Inform my servants that me, I am the most forgiving, I am the most merciful. وَأَنَّ عَذَابِي And that my punishment, not me, my punishment, meaning on the occasion that I do punish. And that my punishment is the severe punishment. No one punishes like me. You notice the difference here. There's a fourth one that comes to mind, or at least that I recall right now in Surah Al-Buruj. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّ بَطُشَ رَبِّكَ لَشَدِيدٌ The the strike of your Lord is so intense. إِنَّهُ هُوَ يُبْدِئُ وَيُعِيدٌ Indeed, He originates and He repeats. Meaning, it is in this world and in the hereafter. If He chooses to, His striking is intense. And He does it and He, he originates and He repeats. You will not escape Allah even through death. If He chooses to punish you. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ And He is, not His punishment. His punishment is an act. If you accept me to use the word momentary, but it is a term, act. It is not who He inherently is, it is an action that He does. My punishment is intense. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ Whereas He is the most forgiving, the most loving. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's clear. So when you read the names of Allah, like here now, وَرَبُّكَ الْغَفُورُ ذُو الرَّحْمَةِ That's who He is. لَوْ يُؤَخِذُهُمْ If He were to seize them by their, the deeds they committed, لَعَجَّلَ لَهُمُ الْعَذَابِ He would have, He would have rushed, meaning in this world, the punishment their way. And so He doesn't punish immediately. Why? To give them a chance to repent, give them a chance to be loved by him despite their crimes. And there's also another benefit, an extrinsic benefit to them, which is that their children may come out Muslim, right? As the Prophet ﷺ said, no, please don't punish. Look how Allah aligned, guided the emotions of the Prophet ﷺ to what Allah loves, right? He, he said to the angel that was sent to punish, don't punish the people of Mecca. Don't crush them between the two mountains. Perhaps their descendants will come out worshipping Allah alone, and they did. Right? And so if Allah... You know, why is Allah Azza wa Jal angry with people on the Day of Judgment? Like people see the Day of Judgment as so angry and so angry. But why is He so angry? That's out of His generosity. He was not disobeyed on the Day of Judgment. He was disobeyed thousands of years before that. And he deferred his anger manifesting for so many people until the Day of Judgment. Right? So they would have a chance. So Allah Azza wa Jal is not fair, or not only fair, He is gracious. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. And so, and the ayah says they have an appointed time. So it's not unlimited. It will be over at some point, but they have some time. Don't... Uh, don't try to judge people on your clock. You know, many times, people, when there's like an oppressor somewhere, and something bad happens to him, they say, yeah, that's because he oppressed me or oppressed my uncle or something. And it doesn't work like this. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Maryam, I think Surah Maryam, فَلَا تَعْجَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّمَا نَعُدُّ لَهُمْ عَدَّ Don't rush for them. We're counting. It's on our clock, not yours. There's a ticker. There's a, there's a count. That you, like you think if you're in the time of Musa alayhi salam, Pharaoh slaughtering babies, you think, oh man, the punishment is coming right now. But it didn't. Musa alayhi salam escaped the slaughter and grew up and got strong and left and spent 10 years out and was commissioned and came back. Then it was the end of Pharaoh. Right? And so it will happen. This is not just a threat also to the, to the, 
the oppressor and the tyrant. This is also a consolation to the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. That where is the, where is the victory of Allah? It's coming. It's coming on his clock for a supreme wisdom. You know, Allah, you see these things in Palestine. You see what's happening in India. And you're just like, how? How? Until when? And the Sahaba were like this. Like, make dua for us, Ya Rasulullah. You're not making dua for us, Ya Rasulullah. And he became angry. He feared the impatience of his followers. Trust Allah's timing. Defer to his timing. When it comes, لَن يَجِدُوا مِن دُونِهَا مَوْئِلَ They will find no refuge. And the last ayah we will cover quickly. وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا وَجَعَلْنَا لِمَهْلِكِهِمْ مَوْعِدًا And those are the societies. Societies? No, next ayah. Next ayah, 59. Yes. And those are the societies we destroyed. When they persisted in wrong, وَجَعَلْنَا لِمَهْلِكِهِمْ مَوْعِدًا And we set a time for their destruction. You know, scholars asked, why is it that this ayah says, tilka al-qura, these cities. So much to say here. These, these are not those, right? Like tilka versus, you know, ulaika, right? Tilka means something right in front of you. Why are those other cities right in front of Quraysh? This is addressing the Prophet ﷺ, right? and the people he sent to. Why are these destroyed nations called these cities? We've destroyed them when they persisted in wrongdoing. Anyone know? Because Quraysh used to pass by the perished nations of Ad and Thamud and Saleh right in front of them when they would go to Asham or go to Iraq and otherwise. And the Quran says this, وَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مُصْبِحِينَ You pass by them when you resume your travels in the morning. You saw these nations. And so these nations were close to them. When they would head towards Asham, they would see the Madain of Thamud, the cities of Thamud. And then the, the verse also does not say Madain or something or like... Uh, uh, it says Qura and the Qarya is a place that is uh, self-sufficient a place that is equipped equipped and comfortable that's why in Arabic uh, is the stuff that you give to a to a guest like you have your food and then <coughs> is the is the action of honoring the guest right and so the qura the cities are the places that have their needs and more in other words those places were not you know just some weak villages some huts and tents and stuff they were fully equipped developed cities and it made no difference we destroyed them when they persisted in wrongdoing and they all had an appointment each of them had a time we didn't rush the punishment because somebody might change his mind, right? As if it's saying to, Qura, to Quraysh, you have your ma'ud as well, hurry up. We gave them an appointment and we're giving you an appointment, but you're not allowed to know when it is. We'll stop there inshaAllah ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik, shadu an la ilaha ilanta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.